What does the classic American film Gone with the Wind have in common with the revered British sitcom Faulty Towers? Well, after entertaining millions and millions of people for decades and decades, they were both recently taken off our screens because it was decided they caused offence. The productions joined a lengthening list of casualties of the cancel culture movement, a growing force of PC police who are determined to rid the world of racism, sexism and all forms of bigotry. Of course, that's a fine ambition, but in this age of outrage, are we too easily outraged? The stage is empty. There is no crowd. The silence speaks of not just COVID, but perhaps an even more contagious force, fear. Thanks to cancel culture. where something that was once deemed funny could now just as easily be considered offensive. A judgment that could and has ended careers overnight. Even British comedic demigod John Cleese has fallen foul. Listen, don't mention the war. I mentioned it once, but I think I got away with it all right. With an old episode of Faulty Towers taken off air after Fresh Eyes judged it to be racist. You know, last year, Faulty Towers was judged the best British sitcom of all time. You were described as a six foot five comedic genius. You must feel like a lot has changed. Uh, comedy is not about perfect people. It's about all of our imperfections. And it's not about things going right. It's all about things going wrong, you know. But does it mean that comedy also has to be offensive? No, of course not. You see, they think that uh, the PC people seem to think that if you make a, a joke or tease someone, you are degrading or humiliating them. And this is a complete misunderstanding. Fire! Fire! fire. No! No! Yes. <laughs> For this titan of comedy to be cast as unacceptable shows the impact of the cancel culture movement, which wields its power through social media. To go from being on such a high pedestal, declared to be so great, and now to be treated, to borrow a line, like a very naughty boy, uh, must feel quite different. <laughs> but it's this pathetic idea that people can't stand up for themselves and uh, can't hear different opinions. I mean, it seems to be extraordinarily condescending. It's a view that has put Cleese on a collision course with those who wish to sanitise our past and blooper-proof our future. I'm a privileged white woman. Maybe it's time for me and people like me to think harder about what we think is funny, what we think is appropriate. Please pay for your purchases and get out and come again. That reflection has already seen some of our most celebrated characters and content cancelled. Oh, I miss you, Farid. After being ruled inappropriate. Yeah, I'm one of the best break dancers in the whole oh. of the school. Yeah, you're the best break breaker in this whole suburb. Yeah, in the whole suburb. But to many, there's an even greater cost of censorship. Tooting, not pong pong for ting tong. We're living in a climate of uh, of fear. People are not um, experimenting or taking risks, and we are in the process of, uh, of really losing our sense of humor as a society. American comedian Kathy Griffin knows intimately what it means for the laughter to stop. As a performer, she has made a career of pushing boundaries. But in 2017, many say she went way too far. In what she considered a comedic protest against the US president, Kathy had this photo taken, holding up a Trump mask covered in tomato sauce to symbolise blood. The photo went viral on social media. Really, my photo was quite banal. You know, holding up a mask with ketchup on it? You know, you want to go for the king, you got to cut his head off. I know him personally, I know what an idiot he is. And I was like, yeah, this guy is not just getting a knock-knock joke. This guy needs his head cut off. Metaphorically, of course. Of course. <laughs> My photo, the infamous photo, which, by the way, was a mask with ketchup on it. 
Can we be clear? It was a mask with ketchup, I promise. Do you think that that was an obscene joke? You know, I have to say, compared to the stuff that Donald does, compared to what Trump does on a daily basis, no. It's like a song sung by a nun with a dove flying above. The online world erupted immediately, calling to boycott Kathy. Disgusting, but not surprising. A smear campaign that very quickly took hold in the real world. Fired her from a Overnight, she was axed, a victim of the cancel culture mob. So the photo went live online, and I believe it was within 24 hours. I started getting show cancellations. I was in the middle of a 50-city tour. I was banned from CNN. You know, then the uh, threats started immediately. So, you know, I mean, you can imagine. It was everything from cutting me open and gutting me like a fish to shooting me to I have figured out where she takes her walk every day. So uh, the, the nature of, of threats became... Uh, very varied and, uh, you know, kind of is around to this day. Kathy Griffin should be... Certainly Donald Trump's administration didn't find it funny. She deserves everything that's coming to her. And Kathy was investigated by the FBI and the Justice Department for a conspiracy to assassinate the president, facing life in jail if convicted. They can take somebody like me, a if you don't mind, well-known American comedian, and convince people, not just all over America, but maybe all over the world, that I might be an ISIS asset? Because that makes sense. It doesn't. It's impossible to believe that anybody within the Department of Justice actually took your photo as a serious threat. But, I mean, I have to ask you, were you trying to incite violence? <laughs> I was not trying to incite violence. A lot of people now find that picture oddly comforting. So there you go. And that's what it's supposed to be, is open for interpretation, like a joke, subjective. We live in these high-risk times when something you, that you and your mates think is funny can blow up in your face. I suppose the consequence of that is perhaps to make us all think a little bit harder about what we do and say. Make us perhaps a little less funny, a, a little, less, little less risque. Could definitely have that effect. Author Jane Caro sees cancel culture as a much needed change, forcing us to view entertainment through the eyes of a minority to understand why it should be pulled. Yeah, we've got a reputation for being like really tough and stuff and teachers are fully scared of us. Yeah. Today, do you feel comfortable watching Chris Lilly and his characters? Not as comfortable as I did when, um, you know, it first hit the screens and I just thought it was hilarious. Four months ago, Chris Lilly's Summer Heights High became a casualty, axed by Netflix for being racist. Well, people are racist to folks. To us. See, to see, we could be racist to runners. But redheads aren't a race, Jonah. But, sir, there's heaps of them. For many years, Lily was one of Australia's most successful comics. While wife beaters and rapists are nearly all public school educated. Writing and starring. No offence, but it's true. In his hit TV comedy series. Oh, I did last year, Sanamarama, which yeah. was about the tsunami tragedy set to the music of Bananarama. The laughs came at the expense of stereotypes. Really cool. You'll fit in, there's so many Asians there. <laughs> But it was Lily's portrayal of a Tongan teenager that saw him taken off our screens. Yeah, but we've got a reputation for being violent and stuff, so we might attack someone. We never, you never know what we might do. That's the point of it, isn't it? It's poking fun, it's satire. Doesn't that give him a leave pass? Not if the people of colour don't think so. I have to accept that I don't know what it's like to see my race portrayed by someone who's not, you know, white like me. And so I'm prepared to shut up and listen. The master of satire, John Cleese, believes the best racist, bigoted characters are meant to reflect the worst in us, to ultimately change bad behaviour. When you are uh, making fun of something, you can do it in two ways. You can do a frontal attack. Simple. That's number one. Or number two, you can put the attitudes that you're making fun on in the mouth of someone who is clearly not to be taken seriously. So you discredit those views in that way. Coming up, Stop you! refusing to shut up. To know that your Faulty Towers episode now carries with it a warning. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you think Basil's bad... You wait till I see my latest film. You won't believe what John Cleese is up to now. Light comedy about cannibalism. <laughs> Very light. That's next on 60 Minutes. We have meat here in the building. <laughs> The 1975 Faulty Towers episode that got John Cleese into trouble is known as the Germans. Don't mention the war. I see. But it was the use of the N-word that marked it temporarily unwatchable. And in June, it was taken off screens, deemed to be racist. The morning, she kept referring to the Indians as n****s. No, 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 I said n****s are the West Indians. These people are wogs. Do you accept that the episode was a guilty of racial slurs? No, because I think it was as though they thought that if you put certain words in people's mouths, that meant it had to be true. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I thought you meant Indians. You're making fun of him for using these very old-fashioned ways of thinking. It's totally a joke against that way of speaking. John Cleese, in turn, used the Twitter world to voice his disgust, and the 45-year-old episode was reinstated within days. But it came with a disclaimer and a warning that it might be offensive. To know that your Faulty Towers episode now carries with it a warning, do you find that upsetting? <laughs> no, I think it's very funny. I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, well, well, you wait till they see my latest film, which I'm writing at the moment. It's a light comedy about cannibalism. <laughs> Very light. And it's, it's called Yummy. <laughs> so it would be nice to see how the BBC responds to showing that on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Ooh. Just hold on. Far from the world of laughs, American classic Gone with the Wind, set in the 1860s, has also earned the ire of censors for its depiction of slavery. It was taken off streaming services until a warning was put in place, explaining its historical context, a move welcomed by social commentator Jane Caro. There's no question that Gone with the Wind is racist, sexist. Or it, 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 its values are from a different era and a different time. Um, and I think it's really important to have those things now pointed out so that we can watch Gone with the Wind with a different lens on. Don't, don't we know that already? I mean, do we, are we not being treated like children to be told this is the context in which this was made and therefore this is how you should view it? Well, until people started to point that out, I think we didn't know it. She done something for you! Miss Molly! Gone with the Wind, it happened. We can't uh, make that unhappen. Uh, I don't want to be... Um, infantilized as a viewer and instructed on how I am to think about the, the work of art I encounter. Miss Garlic Man. High time you got back. Did you get the whole shot? Yes, and he shot But if, right. if a group within that society is offended by the messages in that material, is there not an argument for removing it? I would be very cautious to embrace um, the idea that uh, we know what X community thinks. There is not a black point of view. There is not a gay or a trans point of view. Thomas Chatterton Williams is an author and journalist descended from slaves. So worried was he about the ostracism and shaming of cancel culture that he and colleagues penned this open letter, published on the Harper's Magazine website in July calling for the protection of free speech. More than 150 prominent writers signed the letter, which was translated, republished and celebrated around the world. But it also caused its fair share of fury. The way that cancel culture works is that somebody uh, often transgresses a norm that is not yet set. And then it goes beyond that, a kind of stigma attaches to that person so that they're not supposed to be um, redeemable. And so this is what makes it so dangerous and very unnerving, especially as an author, to see um, a moment in our culture where books are being pulped, removed, rescinded. You're seeing a, in certain places book burnings happen. Uh, this is alarming and it's, it's a mark of a cultural moment right now. And I don't think we should encourage 
the most easily upset, the most easily offended people in our culture to establish a cultural norm. Countering cancel culture, John Cleese is undeterred. He's written what he describes as a short and cheerful guide to creativity, a book which will soon be available in Australia. What impact do you think what you describe as PC has on creativity? It stifles it because anything really creative comes out of spontaneity. You know, I've written a book about creativity. I thought we might get round to mentioning it at some point. <laughs> that, was, that was the lead-in question, John. I wasn't doing it directly. I was doing it indirectly. <laughs> yes, but look, I'm teasing. You can tell I'm enjoying teasing you because you've got a, a beautiful smile. And when I make you smile, I feel good. That's what a lot of jokes are about. You know, you tell a good joke, you make someone smile, everybody feels good. Anyway, I forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> What is and isn't funny will always be subjective. <laughs> Knowing what is and isn't offensive can be equally elusive. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. But even for Thomas Chatterton Williams, free speech is not a free for all. While he supports accountability, he believes it should never equal cancellation. <laughs> when something is clearly racist or sexist, offensive to someone, whether it be in comedy or serious literature or whatever it might be, what should be done about it? I'm certainly not trying to come across as uh, glibly uh, denying the possibility of, of genuine racism, sexism, transphobia, uh, Islamophobia. These things exist and have to be dealt with and people have to be held to account. Yeah, I guess your critics would argue that this is what is being held to account now. This is what it looks like. In 2020. Well, being held to account means that you have a chance to respond. What happens with cancel culture is that it often operates with the logic and velocity of a sucker punch. Um, you're being hit from many angles blindly, and you don't often have the opportunity to uh, face your accuser, face your attacker. Uh, and before you know it, um, the institution that you're associated with uh, simply wants the beating to stop, and, and so you're discarded. That's not being held to account in my book. That's, uh, that's something else entirely. I can't do Jimmy Cagney! For John Cleese, this age of PC, increasingly known as woke, Stop you, my is not so much about being alert to social injustice, but being hypersensitive. I've actually offered to have a debate with somebody of the woke faction. I think it would be funny because the first thing I would say to them is, please tell me a woke joke. You know, what would a woke joke be? Probably this very nice man walked into a bar and said to this very nice uh, <laughs> barman, how are you? Isn't it a lovely day today? And the, and the uh, barman says, yes, well, I can see you're an anti-racist too. You know? <laughs> Very correct and very heartwarming, but not awfully funny. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.